Success is the only revenge. As you expand, they shrink into irrelevance. As you get louder, no one can hear them. You don't beat them. You cast a shadow so big, no one can see them to begin with. When people copy, they copy the wrong stuff because they don't know why it worked to begin with. And when it breaks, they don't know how to fix it because they didn't build it. So don't sweat it. Copycats will always be behind. Good shit. <laughs> but success is the only revenge yeah. it is such a lovely there's that um let me tell you the story behind it damn right yeah so i was 15 years old so this was really early in my life still jacked still jacked <laughs> always jacked perma jacked and i uh <laughs> this sounds so, so lame so i had this teacher so i'm freshman in high school and I might have been 14, whatever the age is. And I'm walking through the hallway and this this teacher is like an admin of some kind, walks out of his office and he's like, he's like, son. And I was like, I'm like, you're just in trouble. What am I gonna do? And he's like, you work out? And I was like, no. He's like, why not? I was like, I don't know how. He's like, I'll show you. He's like, you got the genes. And so that teacher, Mr. Gibbons, um, ended up working out with me every day in high school and sh showed me how to work out. And he probably saw on some level that I was some angsty teenager that felt angry about whatever. And I, during our workout sessions would be like, this guy said this to me, like, he, you know, you know, blah, 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 or like this boy, blah, blah, whatever. And I was like, man, I'm going to come back at our 10 year reunion. And I was like, I'm going to show him. I was like, he's going to be working for me. Like blah, 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 blah. Right. And he's like, no, he's not. And I was like, what do you mean? I was like, let me just have my moment. <laughs> right? He's like, no, he's not. He's like, and you're not going to do that. Not if I have anything to say about it when you come back for that 10-year reunion. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, because if you come back at a 10-year reunion and say, hey, John, like everything I have, look at me now. He's like, the guy's going to laugh and be like, you did all of this to try and prove me wrong? Man, I feel sorry for you. And when he said that, when he actually played out what my like revenge fantasy was in real life, I realized it looked it looked stupid. Petty. Yeah. I looked like the beta in the fucking situation, yeah. right? Yeah. And so he was like, the only thing that you can do is win so big that all of them constantly compare themselves to you. And then you'll forget they exist. And he's and that's when he said, he said, success is the only revenge. He's like, it's not the best revenge. He's like, it's the only one. There's no other revenge. Because everything else is petty. Everything else does show that you were thinking about these people all day long, which means they win by default. He's like, all you can do is think about your goal and winning. He's like, and when you win, that's when you become so big that they shrink into irrelevance. You cast a shadow that no one even can see them behind you. This is the nuance, I think, on, on the previous point when we were talking about the toxicity of that yeah. fuel long term. Yeah. You can see me light up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that when you think about um, the activation energy of using the things that you don't like, yeah. you have to be careful that you're using them and that they're not using you right. still. And a lot of the time, I get this, and in my more juvenile moments, I, I see myself do this, where... I'll know that there's a game that somebody else that I don't like cares about. Yeah. And I'll imagine myself playing that game to beat them so that I can stick it to them right. purely for the reason of sticking it to them. Right. Let's say that there's someone that really cares about being in shape and I'm not in as good shape as I have been in the past. And I know that with muscle memory, if you give me 18 months and a good amount of testosterone, <laughs> like the thing that they care about, right. I would be able to make them feel really bad about. Right. Okay, so... I would hijack my own direction yeah. purely to try and prove somebody else wrong in a desperate and, and somehow believe that that's me taking control of my life. Are you kidding me? I'm allowing them to ventriloquize me yeah. through pain that they didn't even mean to give me. Yeah. The woman in the black dress. Uh, the black pill equivalent. Right. No, like... Now it's like not even a distraction from your main goal. It's like, I'm going to make a new goal just to wrong this person and then somehow make, make up the story that I'm in control of my life when I'm, I'm really just acting in complete reaction to this person. And so in so doing, in beating them at their own game, they've already won by default. Yep. Because they got me to change the game I was playing. Right. Forget about who won. It's like, dude, you were over there and now you're over here. I see this with a lot of people. I, I, I think that it contributes to a lot more of 
why and how people adopt societal norms that the resentment that they have it's it's not just other people want this thing therefore i mimetically want to do this thing too it's i know that other people will respect me and that my resentment will feel justified and manifest if i win at it and that's really compelling that's like a motivational spit roasting coming in from both ends and it's it's really really powerful and you need to be careful i mean I think, you know, one of the really early blessings and I'll be honest, like, this is where I think I was fortunate, right? Like I, I realized when I was about 28, right. Um, that I had been trying really hard to beat. I mean, you'll notice a common theme with a lot of my stories, but I have one central person that I was trying to prove for a very long time, which was my father. Um, and we're on good terms by the way, cause I always get that question. But, uh, this was after I left and he disapproved of my whole thing. And for five years, we didn't talk very much. And so he calls me up um, to, he says, hey, you're going to want to sit down for this. And I'm like, okay, what? Are you pregnant? You know? Um, <laughs> and, so, and so he says, I'm sorry. And and I was like, for what? And he was like, for everything, right? Now, mind you, like this is a Middle Eastern father born in Iran to a Middle, to a Middle Eastern father there who's even more legit. Like, when, where my father was born, women weren't allowed to drive cars. Cars came with drivers with them when you bought them. The driver came with the car. Or like he was born in a very different world. Like fathers don't apologize to sons. It just it was it just wasn't that way. And I have a little bit more a little bit more awareness than I did then, and I can see that now. But for me, I was like, now you apologize. You know what I mean? Um, and so rather than take it for the olive branch that it was, uh, I said. I didn't care about your opinion five years ago when I left. And I was like, and I don't care now. And he was like, well, we'll see how long your success lasts. And so what could have been a really nice exchange ended up becoming pretty, pretty ugly. But the, the main point there was that I wanted to, in the beginning, like make as much as my father, and then it was make more than my father. And then it was make more than my father had ever made in his entire life. And once I had achieved that, I realized that as much as like, it sounds terrible to say this, but like I was trying to beat him at his game. And, and this is pretty alive in a lot of, a lot of Asian cultures, same thing, making money is a big, you know, like when my dad would introduce somebody, he'd be like, this is so-and-so, he makes this much a year. Like, it was, so it was just really Baked clear, in. like, this is how much status someone has. And so like, it was really deep for me. Um, but it was only when I realized that I had won at his game that I realized I'd never even asked the question of like, what game am I trying to win? And I don't know how many people are actually trying to win at a game that they didn't even set the rules up for. So many. When they're in it. And that's why I say, like, I think I was fortunate that I, you know, I hit a, a really tough goal because my dad was, is, is a successful man, um, relatively early on. Um, but that, that, for that exchange and then think like, and then reflecting black and feeling terrible about myself from like saying what I said. And then I was like, I'm, I did everything that I've done to this point to beat him, beat my father, the man who actually raised me, who tried to make me the best man I can. And when I think, when I really start thinking about it, I'm like, I like who I am. He raised me. So doesn't that mean that he might have been the perfect father? And then that really messes with me. <laughs> and so, yeah, so go ahead. Well, it's just, it's hard to think that the people you used to have contempt for or distaste or hatred or whatever shaped you in a way that you couldn't have been. And I often think about how the things I'm most proud of in myself are the light side of something that I was so embarrassed about, yeah. so ashamed about. Um, you know, being an outcast as a kid meant that uh, I love or I'm capable of being on my own way beyond how anybody else is. Yeah. So far beyond it. I, I can work on my own in solitude f for an endless amount of time. Right. I, I can outwork anybody in solitude. Why? Because I spent almost all of my time between the ages of six and 16 in my bedroom listening to audio tapes, right? <laughs> listening to audio books and like throwing like a tennis ball against the wall or like playing with my like yeah. fucking Mighty Mouse from Mars or whatever <laughs> they were called. What was it called? Biker Mice from Mars, that was it. Um, and that was what I did. Yeah. So, but I, I, I did all of that discomfort and all of the challenges that I went through there are the thing, one of the things that I'm so proud of myself for now. Okay, so what if I look back and I said, well, all of the the um 
the bullying that I went through and the challenges of feeling alone and being on the outside of social groups meant that I developed such attenuation and attention and focus and an ability to distill down what's happening socially, which is why I became one of the best club promoters in the UK for a decade and a half. Right. Because for all of my school life, I'd been obsessing over how Alex wears his tie. Maybe that's why he has friends and I don't have friends. Mm. Or the particular brand of shoes that he's wearing. Or the like he carries his bag on that shoulder and I carry, my, carry mine on this shoulder. Because I couldn't deconstruct why I didn't have friends and everybody else did. Right. Okay, so looking back, would I have rather had the friends right. and had the brother or sister and not develop this skill? I can't split test life, so I don't know. Right. But my life's ended up pretty good right. and I'm happy with it. So I need to not only look back at that stuff as something not to hate, but something to genuinely be thankful for. Yeah. And that is frankly something I'm still working through. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah. It goes it goes back to the the first thing, which is like the most traumatic events that happen in our life. You know, they happen for us, not to us. But when you expand the time horizon, like those things, and to be fair, there are people who do have really crappy things happen to them and then it destroys them yes. and then that's it and then they're yeah. just done and that's all it is not everyone has like a moderate amount of childhood bullying and Everybody an does. only child with like parents that care about them or whatever like because you were a child coping with the world with the coping skills of a child i'm still largely that as an, ad <laughs> as an adult infant right and so um but i think that i mean the key the, the, at least for me you know my, my key takeaway from both both of these kind of stories is more that all of the all of the the negative things that happen on the micro have the opportunity if doubled down on to be huge wins in the macro and sometimes in ways that just a micro win would never have the ability to be doubled down on and become a a capital w win in the yeah. macro we'll get back to talking to alex in one minute but first i need to tell you about the number one e-commerce platform Shopify. When I was a nightclub promoter in the UK, I started an online apparel brand with no experience, no coding ability, no marketing background, no inventory management. And after a ton of research, I decided on Shopify. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. You've probably already heard of it. In fact, a lot of your favorite brands still use Shopify, including Gymshark, one of the biggest sports apparel brands on the planet. Shopify is the only tool you need to start, run, and grow your online business without the struggle. What I loved about Shopify was that as we added in new lines and different verticals, it grew with the business. It required zero experience. Every single time there was a problem, I was able to sort it myself. That's how simple it is. There is a $1 per month trial period that you can sign up for right now with the link in the description or by going to shopify.com slash modern wisdom, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash modern wisdom to take your business to the next level today. Oh, hey, thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed that clip, then press here for the full three-hour podcast with Alex. Go on, press it. <laughs>